Hello, my name is Jill Goodburn and I'm the secretary of EMIS's local group Fife for Europe. And at our monthly meeting on the 3rd of February, Liz Smith was our guest and we enjoyed her presentation and had an interesting discussion with her afterwards. But we had a technical problem starting the recording and missed her introduction. So just let me tell you before, before we start the recording that Liz was a teacher for 16 years before joining the Scottish Parliament in 2007 as a Conservative Regional MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. She was then served as Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Education, and then for Environment and currently for Finance and the Economy. She assured us that she is a strong Remainer and always had been. She was very saddened by the Brexit vote when it happened and emphasised the importance of Scotland continuing to fight to retain European standards. She was a strong Remainer from the economic point of view, but also from a cultural and social aspect. She wants to build bridges. And now we'll jump into her talk. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Cooperation. The fact that um, you know you have um, a, a very important market out there, um, which uh, I thought was instrumental in in determining uh, so much about this country, and um, but also from a cultural and social angle, and that's what perhaps disappointed me just as much as the economic angle uh, when we were uh, forced to withdraw. Um, but I think we should recognise that uh, that vote was uh, cross-party and was happened at different points in different parts of the country. Um, and while we might all be surprised by it and disappointed by it, I think we do have to accept it as Democrats. And I think the, the most important thing now is that we try to get on and, and, and move forward. And so I, I, I think in terms of how Scotland approaches this, um, I, I would somebody in politics who would like to see much greater cooperation uh, between uh, different governments and including local government. Um, that's one of the reasons I was actually very keen on uh, being part of the EU is that I think, you know, politics is much better if we can uh, build bridges and be part of one thing rather than uh, create division. Um, so I think when it comes to Scotland just now, I mean, there are lots of serious issues uh, that are affecting the economy, but they're not all down to Brexit. Um, un unfortunately, some of them are, uh, particularly labour market shortages, and I don't need to tell people in Fife about some of the very serious issues that are affecting uh, the rural economy. Uh, I've been working with uh, Willie Rennie um, quite substantially on this issue because I'm very conscious, um, just as I am with you know, farmers in, in Perthshire and you know, it means a, a huge amount to them to have lost a, a, a substantial um, supply of their labour, um, many of whom came from um, Eastern Europe and who were absolutely superb when it came to uh, delivering the jobs that had to be done um, across Perthshire and Fife. Um, and I've been lobbying the UK government about this because I think it's I think it's very unfortunate that there is this uh, division and a, a, and a feeling that, you know, for many people who whose families perhaps came here before and who would like to come here and settle and work um, feel that, you know, we're not particularly welcoming. And I, I think that's uh, very regrettable. But let me say that I, I don't think this is all uh, just about uh, Brexit. I think there are lots of other pressures here and. Uh, some of these are international, as my goodness, we're seeing that today with the announcements about uh, energy uh, price increases. You know, it's overwhelmingly the case that a lot of this uh, concern over the energy price issue it has arisen from um, international traders who are facing huge increases in their shipping costs and in you know gas supplies, etc. So, you know, I, I don't want anybody to think that it, it's just a Brexit issue because it isn't. Um, there are lots of complicating economic factors around just now, and a lot of that is feeding inflation. Um, so it's not just to do a labour market shortage, it's to do a lot of trends in, in the international market. But uh, as I say, I'm very much of the view that we should be trying to uh, mend bridges and ensure that the post-Brexit um, Britain that we have to deal with 
is one that is welcoming, that is um, able to um, produce increased productivity and economic growth, that it's attractive for investment, that it can deliver um, jobs. And, you know, there are some good signs in one or two things in some of the trade deals, there are one or two uh, good signs, but there are still some worries, um, particularly when there, there is a gap, obviously, having come out of the EU, there's a gap when it comes to um, environmental issues, for example. Um, you know, do, do we pitch into the legislation um, that uh, is uh, EU? Um, but then if, you, if you're not in the EU, then you've got no influence over how that legislation is made. So there's, there's a lot of issues in here. Uh, and I'm very keen that the UK government, and in some cases the Scottish government, is trying to uh, pursue ambitions when it comes to policies of, of making it uh, very clear that you know we have high standards, whether that comes to the environment or to animal um, trading or uh, you know the, the, the general approach to um, policy across European Union. Um, and I think it's I think it's very important that both the Scottish government and the UK government are scrutinised. Uh, to ensure that they are delivering the highest standards, because I think it would be too easy um, to when you when you come into something new that's very different from what you've been in since uh, 1975. Um, you know, you can get complacent and you can perhaps um, not be as scrutinizing as you should be on, on, on some of these issues. But but I was actually uh, relatively um, sort of encouraged by the fact that both governments, I think, are, are taking this seriously. And, and I think we've got a lot of work to do to ensure that we are meeting the standards uh, to which uh, we aspire. Can I talk just a little bit um, about uh, education, which is um, not only my own profession, but my own um, academic training and a, a job that I was in for um, most part of 12 years in the parliament. Um, I think Scotland uh, has some of the uh, highest standards in further and higher education. I won't say too much about schools at the moment because I think we've lost some of that uh, credibility and I do worry about some of the, um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are, in my, in my view are wrong with um, Scottish schools just now. You know, what I think grieves me most is that we've got some tremendous schools and tremendous resources but we're not really getting uh, to the highest standards just now. And I think there are various reasons for that. But when it comes to colleges, and Fife uh, is blessed with some very good colleges, and obviously when it comes to a university like St Andrews, um, you know, almost first in the world, never mind first in Britain with, with so many different things. And what I think is important in university education just now, particularly as we've had this problem with uh, Erasmus and Horizon, is that... The, the replacement, the Turing system, about which I had some initial reservations, is seen to deliver um, exactly what we had before, but to enhance that. And one, one of the things that I do actually like about the Turing um, programme is that I think it's, it's more diverse, and I think it will do more for people who have had, um, you know, a difficult time through education and uh, people who perhaps wouldn't have um, been able to access uh, higher education in Scotland and for people who've got uh, disabilities and I think the opportunities across the world uh, might be greater than uh, obviously the Erasmus system which was which was based in Europe but and I come back to this uh, quite importantly I think the two issues we have to address the Erasmus system was extremely successful um, and obviously it was backed up by um, really a good amount of money and I think you know if you're talking in terms of um, what's being proposed just now, uh, the Turing system is not quite matching that, although the Scottish government's come in uh, with its own system. Um, and so I, I think we have to be absolutely clear that what we're delivering in higher education, uh, particularly when it comes to um, students who are wanting to involve in research and to uh, a lot of the sort of, you know, cutting edge um, education in universities, feel able uh, to participate in that. And if, if they do, and I think there are some encouraging signs, 
then I think that's um, th that's a very good sign. I think we have to do everything possible in education policy to ensure that that uh, happens because, you know, I, I'm absolutely convinced that Scotland has got huge potential in, in education and um, we, we need to make sure that that comes through our um, institutions. And, you know, St Andrews uh, University absolutely leads the way thanks to um, a wonderful principal that they have in Sally Mapstone, um, but also the facilities that they have and they, they, you know, got such a, a high profile in the name that they um, work with research and development. And we have, to, we have to articulate the policy around that so that we are uh, not only attracting the uh, best investment, but also the best staff and students. And I think we have to do more work to ensure that um, staff and students who would like to come and work in Scotland uh, feel welcome, feel able to do that, and that we can uh, protect them. Because I think if we don't do that, then I think that would be a huge downside uh, for Brexit. So I've been fighting uh, very hard with the UK government and with the Scottish government to ensure that we can uh, make people feel welcome and that nothing undermines the outstanding talent that we have in Scotland um, and the ability to, as I say, take education uh, forward. So that's a little bit about where I would come from in terms of the uh, policies that I would like to uh, see us aspire to. Um, Brexit was by no means um, satisfactory. We know that. Um, I was, uh, as I said, as upset as uh, you would have been about it. But we do have to accept that that's what's happened. Um, we have to accept that there were people across all different political persuasions who voted for Brexit for a variety of different reasons. And we have to get on with a post-Brexit Britain and post-Brexit Scotland. So I, I think we have to be very outward looking. I think we have to uh, ensure that um, there is money that is following a lot of the initiatives that, that you know, will bring um, as much success to Scotland as we had uh, before. But I also think that we have to try very hard to get over some of the divisions, um, constitutional divisions, that, in my opinion, do not help uh, what we're trying to achieve. But I'd like to see much greater cooperation between the UK and Scottish governments and between the Scottish government and local authorities. And a lot of the, the, um, the things I like best about Europe is that it was wide ranging and keen to sort of take on board people from lots of different countries and, and bring them together. And I think, you know, that, that's, that's sort of my ambition uh, for what we have to do uh, in so many different dimensions of policy. Anyway, I will stop there because I'm sure you want to ask lots of questions um, and feel free to ask on anything you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. That's a very interesting way to open up our discussion. And um, it's great that we've got someone here who's such an educational specialist, because certainly we've, we've, we've tried to put a lot of time into um, campaigning about Erasmus. And we've had meetings with with. The, the Scottish government officials who are working on the new Scottish programme and um, I think we're still concerned that it doesn't seem to be happening very fast and I think we're very concerned about the fact that Turing is a one-way programme and that people can go but we're not welcoming people back because as you said that's such a critical thing mm -hmm. and then really that the the Scottish universities are, are we're also respected and good at it, that we hope that they, they seem to be managing. I know I have a nephew who came from France to Harriet Watt for a term, and it was just like an Erasmus term. So Harriet Watt are obviously keeping their links with this big engineering school in Lyon going very well. Um, but we're really kind of worried about the Erasmus Plus aspect as well, which is the schools and the um, uh, colleges and language learning and teacher training and all of these things that, um, we're just getting established um, and oh, like apprenticeships that, you know, that was fantastic and sports clubs and things. And they definitely have less um, background and, and sort of uh, networks to draw on than the universities. And so we really hope that that's what the, the Scottish programme will focus on. Um, so if, if there's any opportunity to push in that direction on that one, I think we would all really welcome that. Yes, I, I think I, I think there are opportunities. I, I, I think you're right to say it hasn't progressed very far because I think there's a bit of uncertainty about how much money. I mean, you're probably well aware when you scrutinise uh, the budget for the coming 2022-23, uh, it, it doesn't feature, uh, and, and and that is a worry. 
um, and you, you know the, the Turing system undoubtedly will give you know substantial funding, but it doesn't quite match uh, what was available from Erasmus, and you're quite right about the fact that there's not enough of a a, a two-way process in that. Um, so I, I think it's incumbent upon the Scottish government to come, to come forward with um, their ideas about what this addition would would provide and wh whether it matches the same aims as the Turing system or whether it's to be different. I think that has to be you know, very clear to our institutions mm -hmm. and I think it has to be very clear to our um, senior pupils in schools because if they want to take advantage of, uh, of this, then they, they, they need to know what they're buying into. Yeah. And uh, that's not something, and, and you know, let, let's be honest, I, I think the generation that is um, sort of 16 to 22 just now, it has been extremely hard hit by COVID. Um, I, I spend a lot of time with um, youngsters who are uh, 16 to 18 uh, across schools um, and my own personal um, uh, coaching that I do with sport. And I, I'm very conscious just now of just how many of them have felt withdrawn um, during their educational experience um, because they've been forced to undertake uh, education pretty much on their own with, you know, online as we are just now, but without the social and cultural engagement that you would expect in a school. And the, the apprehension um, about going back into dare I say, a semi-normal world is considerable. I was, I was just chairing a, um, a cross-party group um, on colleges and universities at lunchtime today. And we had, this was about mental health. We had some fascinating insight from uh, several pre people across the colleges and universities who were saying that they are very conscious of just how many youngsters feel um, quite anxious about engaging in the, in the educational system. And therefore, I think there is potential for that to have an impact on how many of our youngsters would like to go abroad and feel comfortable about going abroad and more importantly about families having people back because you know not that long ago I, I, I think uh, a lot of young people felt that the world was their oyster, their oyster and that they were willing to do all sorts of things. I, I think Covid has had an impact on that detrimentally and so, you know, universities and colleges are working very hard to try to address some of this, but I think we need to get schools uh, to do that too. And if there's anything that, you know, the Scottish government uh, could do within its uh, Scottish Education Exchange uh, programme, that would be very helpful to give people um, some comfort that they were being well looked after um, uh, and just yeah. some certainty about what it was. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And I do hope that they do do that because my three kids are exactly between 16 and 22. So I know exactly what you're talking about. I, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, can we open the floor? Does anyone else have something that they would like to pick up on that from what Liz has said? Paul? Um, um, it's about Erasmus. It's exactly as we heard there is that Erasmus Plus has got so many extra opportunities compared to Turing. Turing really pales in comparison with it. And it is such a shame that the UK government decided that they didn't want us to take part in this because we didn't have to be in the EU to remain in Erasmus. And that's one of the things I think that we all find is so frustrating. And to be quite honest, it's it is so, it makes me quite angry because it, it's reduced the amount of opportunities available to our youngsters. And as you said, Scotland is quite an outward looking country mm -hmm. and we have got tremendous links with universities, etc., all the way around the world, not just Europe. I do like a little bit about the Turing system, don't get me wrong, because it does expand it to the rest of the world. And I've got some family, um, involvement in that but unfortunately because of COVID as you rightly said that had to be cancelled this year because of the two-way street uh, the other country basically was was struggling to allow people in however in the future I think we should be moving towards a closer alignment with Erasmus taking with it the best part of Turing and part of that is is really to be 
equivalent to a country like Turkey who is in it. We don't have to be inside the EU to take advantage of some of the fantastic opportunities that the EU, with its partner countries, provides. Mm. And it, it just seems to me it's more ideology that prevented the UK government from taking part in it rather than anything else. And they have put less money into Turing as well, as you right, rightly pointed out, which means, unfortunately, it is a pale shadow of Erasmus. Mm. And we really need to be, in my, in my view, uh, taking as much as we can out of the better things that we were in, involved in with the EU and trying to take those forward, even if we're not in the EU. Yeah, what I, I, I think, Paul, that's exceptionally uh, well said. Uh, I can't disagree with that at all. I mean, I, I think the, the most important thing that I want to see in education, and I've got some personal experience of this, in that when it came to, uh, I was involved with several schools, um, and I'm very keen on the baccalaureate system in education, uh, whether that's, you know, the international baccalaureate, the French baccalaureate. One time we were talking about having a Scottish baccalaureate, and I'm keen on it because it is outward looking rather than inward looking in a curricular sense, but also because I think it is um, very cross-curricular, and I think it's the, the academic, or sorry, the intellectual uh, credibility of baccalaureate, I think, uh, outweighs a lot of the sort of uh, national curriculum uh, exams that we do. And I, I was involved in a school, or was it two schools that actually were trying to introduce the international baccalaureate um, at the same time as offering the Scottish system. But parents in Scotland were very resistant to it because they didn't feel that it was Scottish enough and that you know that the hires and the advanced hires were sort of the gold standard of Scottish education. Now frankly I don't actually believe that any longer. Uh, I think the hires and the advanced hires which should be the gold standard I think they have been diminished in their um, uh, intellectual credibility and I also think they've become I think the subject choice issue is huge um, and, and Fife is a good example of many uh, uh, secondary schools that have not got this, the, the extent of the subject choice that they would have had in the fourth and the fifth year, and that has an impact on sixth year, and by definition that has an impact on people applying to university and college and whatever. And I think that one of the great advantages of uh, being a European uh, was that the, the, the international dimension to the baccalaureate, I think, was very attractive because it could allow somebody who'd done perhaps two years at Edinburgh University, went off to Maastricht or to Zurich or whatever, and it gave them that understanding, not just about their subject, but a, a dimension that was um, so important to them understanding uh, the sort of history and the culture and the, you know, the, the whole... Uh, development of a, of a different society and I think that breeds um, you know a, a very strong awareness about other cultures a tolerance of, of what's going on in the world and my greatest concern about coming out of Europe is that if we're not careful we will lose some of that um, and I, I think if we are to ensure that uh, Erasmus um, is replaced by Turing plus um, the, the Scottish system, we have to try to get that back because I, I think it's vital that youngsters um, who, you know, let's be honest with the digital economy and, um, you know, the, the world is a very small place these days, they want, I think, deep down to be able to take advantage of these things, but they're nervous just now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the Scottish uh, exam system helps them. Uh, and I certainly don't think that uh, some of the uh, aspect of um, you know university funding necessarily helps them. That's so interesting. I'm sorry to hop in again, but the only reason really that we're in St Andrews is because my kids, one of them, was doing the baccalaureate in Belgium, mm. and sadly there are no there are no state schools in in Scotland. There are some in England that do it, but St Leonard's does it brilliantly. They have a whole school program, mm. and. 
when we discovered it, my poor dyslexic child who couldn't be in the French speaking system in, in Belgium got this amazing opportunity to be in an international school. And we started looking at the comparison between French speaking Belgium education is a little bit in the dark ages and what my son was doing in his French high school compared to what Brie was doing on, on the baccalaureate program was just so many poles apart. Yeah. And to see how to see the confidence it's given them to go off the two big ones are at university and they're just in a totally different place from where I was at first year university. But I think I, I quite agree with you because I, I think one of the great advantages of the baccalaureate is not just about the disciplines that you're doing, but the fact you have a theory of knowledge that, that there's exactly. a That's that within the baccalaureate, there's you're not only learning subjects, you're learning how to learn and how different subjects relate to each other. And that, that's why I'm a great fan of the baccalaureate, is that I think it lifts people up to be able to appreciate all the different uh, disciplines. But my point is that we, we might try to uh, perpetrate uh, the you know, instigation of this in Scotland, but Scottish parents, by and large, are very resistant to it because they think it's something different and untried and untested. And they think it's difficult. That's the problem. They think it's too hard. But mm -hmm. the Scottish system is so nearly there compared to, say, the A-level system, because what's great about hires is you keep quite a lot of subjects. And if instead of doing them in fifth year, you actually did what the diploma does, made it six subjects, but over two years, and you kept some at a lower level, and it still mm -hmm. allows you to do three subjects like you might do in sixth year with your advanced hires, but you actually spend two years working towards it and not being interrupted. And I mean, but, I remember- but, that, but that's not true in, in, in all the schools in Scotland. I mean, Scotland was renowned for you know a very long period of time because of the breadth of education and the ability to, you know, look. in fact, actually Scottish education in, days gone by was quite like the uh, international baccalaureate. Yeah, exactly. but what, but what's happened with the curriculum for excellence is that subject choice in far too many schools has been completely and utterly squeezed uh, so that yeah. that, that um, uh, constrains the options, particularly for bright youngsters uh, who um, you know, are constrained in their sixth year and therefore they're constrained in their applications to colleges and universities. And the colleges and universities will tell you that because of that, you know, they're having to, uh, they're not exactly having to downgrade some of their entries, but they're, they are having to think about who they will take. And of course, on top of that, you've got all the financial concerns. If you're, um, you know, if you're going to provide fees, if you come from England or you come from uh, international, well, yes, international, not so much EU now, but if you come there, you're going to, um, as a bursar uh, in the university, you're going to be persuading your um, academic tutors. Well, actually, we've got an important uh, financial line here. Um, let's take St Andrews or Edinburgh or Glasgow with medical schools. Uh, do we take more people who are willing to pay quite substantial fees because that suits us and uh, sustains us more? Or do we take more Scots domiciled students? Mm. And that's a massive issue. Massive. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, open up the floor to somebody else. Who else has a question on perhaps on another subject now? Oh, Bill, you've got your hand up. Sorry, we can't see you, Bill. Are you OK there? Uh, yeah, I don't know what's wrong, uh, Joe. For some reason, the video of taking offense at my face. So, <laughs> uh, you just have to put on my anonymous voice. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Let's, first of all, I, mean, I say it's a uh, your exposition sounds very like the kind of the old joke, the old Irish joke about you know uh, wouldn't start out from here. Yeah. Uh, that you know, the, 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 and, and that we we are where we are, uh, and and we start out from here. It's certainly refreshing to hear a, a senior conservative politician saying. Uh, things like you know Brexit improved. There, there are things that we could do to make, make life better with Brexit. That seems to have you know, kind of a, a story of denial uh, up till now. Certainly, my my years, I've not really been hearing it from from enough places. And of course, it comes along about the same time as some of your colleagues in Scotland have been um, putting a little bit of distance between themselves and and the UK. 
Conservative uh, position. And, and I know that you're also working with Willie Rennie, uh, because we know this from a previous meeting. You mentioned it yourself in turn on on the on the on the uh, the quotas uh, for, for for I think it's just seasonal workers. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so these these are kind of baby steps, if you like, back to what most of us, well, all of us here would like to see. Um, and that may, or we, we don't know where that would end up. It's, it's, it's a recognition that we have to be practical, both in terms of where we start from, also in terms of efficiencies of where we start from and how we might improve that. Can we look forward to more of these baby steps and, and you know, is, is there is, is there is there other areas besides uh, Erasmus Plus? I mean, and, and my, my take on Erasmus Plus is that, that Turing and Goldtire are ticking plasters, and the, the the basic fact that will always be there that these are sticking plasters. Mm. Uh, why why not buy your way into something which is ready made and recognised around the world? Yes, uh, I, I, in terms of coming back to the baby steps, is is, is there are other areas that you could you could foresee where we 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 maybe inch towards something that's less damaging? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bill. I think you you make a very good point there. I mean, let, let me deal with the agricultural side of things. I, I mean, I, I, I live in Perthshire and um, I'm, I'm live on a farm. And so every year, every day, I get my ear bent about um, European issues, um, whether that's to do with uh, the price of lamb, or whether it's to do with potatoes, or whether it's to do with the crops, or whether it's to do with farm workers. And you know, for well, I've been there for what, 22 years now, and I can remember not long after I settled in Perthshire that. A lot of the people who came to work on the farms around me uh, were from uh, Poland and from uh, Romania, and they were absolutely first class, also delightful, I may say. Um, and I think it's true to say as well that they were taking back pretty low wages. Uh, I think a lot of farmers were uh, using the attraction of people who uh, went you know, to, to help their farms, but actually weren't getting a very sustainable uh, income. And that changed a bit, um, as in I think, you know, people recognised the worth uh, that, they, that they brought, and, and also the social interaction that they brought. So I, I think the steps that you talk about uh, are, are important. And I think, dare I say that I think agricultural can, can lead the way on this, a little bit because I think there are issues that have arisen post Brexit um, in the agricultural world, whereby it's quite clear that we need each other. We need each other for uh, trade, but we need each other for a whole lot of um, uh, different reasons in terms of uh, farming uh, acumen. But also, it's essential that we have uh, a movement both um, uh, from uh, Scotland and abroad, but particularly from abroad to Scotland, because they they, they bring such a huge addition uh, to us. And I, I, I think that one of the reasons that Willie Rennie and I, who we may be from different political parties, but we get on uh, really well on this issue because we can see right across Fife and right across Perthshire, right across Stirlingshire, um, that we are suffering by not uh, having the same uh, flexibility of the labour market that we would have done uh, pre-Brexit. And that's uh, a worry. So just to come back to the question you were asking, what, what do we have to do in terms of taking the steps? I, I think it will be the practical um, experience of many people across uh, the, you know, the different sectors who are telling us, telling all political parties just now, um, what, what their concerns are and I think the more that we can get a cross-party um, agreement on this, the, the stronger our chance will be to, to, to rectify some of the problems that we've been discussing earlier this evening. Because my biggest worry in, in Scotland is that, you know, politics can be just so divisive and so 
introverted, so difficult. Uh, I don't think it's particularly outward looking at all. And that worries me. I don't think it's internationalist. Uh, it, it, people talk about being internationalist, but you know, when it comes to the actual nuts and bolts of what we're doing, I, I don't really think it is at times. Um, and, and that worries me um, a lot. So I think um, uh, just to take uh, back from your, your the second part of your question, I think we need to do a lot more to ensure that we are cooperating and uh, delivering from what local communities want us uh, to do. Because you know, if you listen to the community councils across Fife or uh, Perthshire, Stirling, um, th they've each got a very different perspective on things just now. And I think you know, politics has become uh, very uh, tribal, very uh, sort of. Uh, national level orientated, and I don't think that's a good thing. So um, I, I totally take your points there. I think, and then what you're saying is is very poignant, actually. No, it's, it's, thanks for that, Liz. I mean, as I say, it is refreshing to hear it. Uh, the the uh, from from a, from a, a senior conservative uh, politician. Uh, and can we look forward to hearing more of, of, of this sort of thing? As, as Because that's where the cross-party movement needs to come from, really. Uh, yes, it, it, you're, you're right. I mean, it does. I mean, I think <laughs> one of the, the, the aspects of the Scottish Parliament is, 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 is it's not supposed to be uh, tribal. You know, it, it was designed uh, not to be tribal and that it would be very cross-party and its engagement, well, <laughs> in my experience in 15 years, uh, it's become more tribal uh, and you know more divisive. And, and you know, look at Westmont. Well, forget the awful situation in Number Ten, which we will try to put to aside just now. Not easy, but we will try to do that. Uh, I mean, it, it's even more tribal. And I think you know, with a, a European referendum, which was difficult, a Scottish uh, referendum two years before that, and you know the threat of another Scottish uh, referendum. Um, I, I just don't like the, the way that politics is going because I do think it becomes very incestuous and I think on top of the fact there's an awful lot of lack of trust in politics and politicians just now and we can um, put the blame in various quarters with that. That is not helpful to the body politic and it's not helpful to the way that we would like to move forward to address some of your concerns, Bill. Um, so what do we have to do? Uh, I mean, I, I'm a politician that believes that while you stick to your views and you, know, you make your speeches according to uh, your own political convictions, I think we have to do much more as representatives to try to engage with other political parties and to try to find some cross-party consensus on issues that really matter to you know, the, the benefit of Scotland. And, Let's be honest, I mean, I sit on the Finance Committee, as you know, um, and uh, the last, uh, the budget process and the last sort of three, four months where we've been taking evidence about the Scottish economy, it is not good news. Productivity is weak. Uh, investment is weak. Economic growth is weak. The labour market issues are a real problem. And that's not just down to Brexit or to COVID. I mean, this has been going back quite a long time. And so we're, we're really needing policies that bring the political parties together so that we stimulate um, in economic growth and investment and uh, more jobs. Um, and I don't think it's helpful to have tribal politics on top of that. Yeah, sorry, I'm, 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 going to, I'm just going to push up a point a wee bit more, but if that's OK. Mm. Uh, the, the, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you on a lot of that. There is, there's, a, there's, there's a real danger in terms of tribalism in, in Scotland. Uh, the, 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 it's, it, for me, the key word in what you set forth was outward or base, outward looking. And for me, that's one of the great things about Europe that enables an outward looking population or facilitates it, it helps to develop it. And, and we really don't appreciate as a cult just how important that is. We've, mm. we've become so used to looking at the world through a, 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 a lens which works uh, down, down the way south and then out to the world instead of viewing the world for what it is, straightforwardly what it is. Uh, so um, 
Yeah, I, I, I look forward to more baby steps prompted by you and your colleagues, Liz, and I'll shut up now, I've said enough. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bill, we've got a few other hands up. So maybe, I think, Beryl, you were, you were next, um, if you'd like to pose your question. Thanks, Joe. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, to say something about on education. I know we've covered a lot about education, but just to point out that, um, you know, I've long felt and I've, I've seen from children around here that they are disadvantaged in some ways. It's nice to have the possibility of free university education in Scotland. Um, but on the other hand, as, as you've pointed out, Liz, as, as or indicated, if they don't pay fees, then they are at a disadvantage if they're in a competitive situation with students from elsewhere. But the, re the reciprocal um, applies too, because um, there are often Scottish youngsters who don't apply to English universities where they might prefer to engage with particular courses and offerings down there because their families can't afford it. And you know, years ago, um, we would have given grants and all the rest of it, but that doesn't happen now. So Scottish students are confined to Scotland, and that reinforces the points that you've been making, I think, about, look, you know, being outward looking and all that sort of thing. You know, they, it does encourage them to become more um, parochial, if you like, rather than being more internationalist and outward looking and yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm you're ab ab absolutely right, Beryl. And I mean, I I'm somebody who supports um, uh, a graduate contribution, not, not the same mm -hmm. as a graduate tax uh, mm -hmm. and not the same as um, upfront uh, tuition fees. Mm -hmm. I and I'm of that opinion because I, I think it's uh, a, a, a is a disastrous situation that we have just now where it's highly discriminatory where uh, Scottish domicile students and uh, as it was EU students uh, before Brexit were treated completely differently from rest of the UK and international yeah. students yeah. and it put it put the burden on the university uh, not to decide because of academic reasons as to who are the best students and the best staff to take on it incidentally but the best students it became a financial decision. Mm -hmm. And that is just so wrong. I mean, one of the great attributes about European education and Scottish education uh, as part of that is that we have always valued academic excellence. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should always be, in my opinion. And you will not get that with any system that divides uh, the student intake according to their income and their uh, home background. That's just so wrong. And if you want to support a first class uh, uh, university system, you have to have an income that is coming into that sector uh, that is, uh, you know, aspires to that, uh, the delivery of that highest uh, standard. So either you have to put up uh, taxation and pay more into uh, education uh, through GDP than is currently the case in the UK, or if you're not going to do that, then you have to have an alternative uh, source of income. You can perhaps uh, cut other expenditure and other budgets, but it's not going to be very popular. But you have to find an additional source of income. And for me, that's a graduate contribution, which is which, which is part of the way that you know a lot of European countries uh, uh, operate, and you know, like so New Zealand do that. Um, and, and I worry that the, the just exactly what you said, Beryl, that if we if we don't attend to this. We're going to have a, a system that uh, sort of separates out students and it makes uh, Scottish students who are just as able uh, as any students anywhere else, but they're going to their horizons are going to be diminished because they see it in the sort of um, microcosm that is Scotland rather than branching out and doing things. Uh, according to uh, where their academic abilities might lie in other countries. And that's one of the reasons why I was so upset about, about Brexit, because I think Brexit helped to uh, widen um, perspectives and horizons. Uh, 
But now we've got a system um, where I think, you know, the Scottish government, in my opinion, has got higher education funding all wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the UK government's got it all right. It hasn't. But I, I, I do think there's a, there's a serious issue about the way that Scottish universities are funded. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, my, good. I'm glad you agree with that um, and share, share that concern because it's worried me for some time. My other my main area um, of interest this evening was... Um, to my concerns about environmental standards and where we're going with these, both UK-wide and in Scotland. And, you know, with the, the relative environment acts or environment bills going through the two parliaments. And I'm particularly concerned about monitoring and regulation. And it's, it's not just environmental things, it's things like REACH, you know, the chemical yeah. assessments. And, um, a few things I've seen produced in Scotland recently, um, for instance, the MPF4 mm -hmm. and planning policy, you know, the successor to Scottish planning policy, that I'm very concerned about these because they seem to be very much um, uh, economic growth driven. They're not yeah. necessarily sustainable and environmental standards are already slipping because the roles and independence of SEPA and Nature Scott have been diminished over recent years, probably over about the last 10 years, which is some coincidence. And the, um, the oh no, what was my other area? Um, I'll leave it at that for now. I might think of my other point. Yeah, I mean, I, I sat on the Environment Committee uh, for uh, a year mm. and we were, at, it was at the time where we were having to deal with a lot of the uh, negotiation over it because, you know, all, all these um, directives that you we had because of uh, yeah. Brexit, we had to put them through. And, uh, I, I worked, like you, I worried ab about some of the um, ways that we were uh, having to sort of reassess what it was that was how, how did you define high in, uh, environmental standards that that was the basic issue and the, the, there was there was a huge division between the UK and Scottish governments yes uh, the UK government to my mind was a little bit complacent about some of the uh, issues and the Scottish government was absolutely determined that we had to just sign up to uh, what had been EU rules and in my case, I, I, I didn't really go for either of these things because I think uh, the, the, the UK government wasn't accepting that there, you know, that there were uh, different um, issues in Scotland or in Wales and Northern Ireland and indeed in different parts of England. Uh, I think it was becoming too sort of um, broad brush to accept that there were you know, different different criteria in different parts of the country, but neither did I accept the Scottish uh, government's um, uh, you know, aspiration just to sign up to everything that the EU had already done, because I, I don't think that was right in that we were going to sign up to something where we had absolutely no control over what uh, new regulations might come out. So I find myself on that committee very much in the sort of middle uh, of the debate, and I think it's important when it comes to environmental standards that we, and I think this is, a, a, well, for, for me, who's not an expert in environmental issues, I, I found the evidence uh, that we had to uh, read through and uh, take on board was so extensive from completely different scientific uh, backgrounds. It was actually, it was difficult um, because it was all saying slightly different things. And I, and I find that, committee was it was very interesting but it was it was a very difficult committee to work your way through to understand exactly what was fact and what was fiction uh, and what we should be doing um but but no you, you're right Beryl I mean it is it is an issue about what we what we do and my sort of um abiding aim is to ensure that we are doing the best for the environment uh, in Scotland according to uh, what uh, nature is, is telling us and that, that has to be science uh, driven um, and we have to understand that the way that uh, humans and science interact on that is, is increasingly complex but for me it's it's basically uh, nature driven in terms of what 
outcomes we want we want to be able to achieve. Mm, yeah, yeah, and for instance, I've, I've just responded to there was a, um, a Scottish government um, consultation on the um, revision mm. of the onshore wind policy. Oh yeah, yeah. Can't be fresh. So that consultation closed on the thirty first, and it was appalling, really. I mean, I'm I'm really very pro renewables and things. You know, I've got solar panels. I'm keen on all that sort of thing. Mm. But um, it really was just a wind wind company developers charter, and there's not the whole breadth of different. You know, the, all the different other renewables weren't mentioned. I suppose it was about wind policy, but you should really to put wind. Uh, generation context you do have to mention all the other factors yeah, and yeah. all the all the other technologies and um when it well my big thing is landscape and we've worked hard with landscape and wind energy i'm always going to meetings about it but um that was reduced to two paragraphs which were very um which were very dismissive and they didn't even mention national parks, national scenic areas, and even the stuff that we really have to do, you know, the natural heritage, you know, basically birds and peat. Um, th there was quite a bit on peat, but it did leave a lot. There were lots of emission, important emissions, and uh, wildlife was, you know, you just feel it's put in there. It's, it's rhetoric and reality, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm somebody that's... Um, um, in my own uh, spare time, such as it is, um, you know, I, I walk Scotland hills and uh, yeah, yeah. countryside all the time, and I live in the countryside, and uh, nobody could be more orientated towards that than, than I am. Um, but it, it angers me, actually, as to how much some of the environment uh, brief is driven by ideology and by... Mm -hmm. Uh, people trying to have a political agenda rather than understanding what nature is telling us and uh, what we should be doing collectively um, to, to get the best out of it. Because I, I, th I think some of the environmental uh, lobbying, uh, that's on both sides, that's not a, a oh, yes, political point. You know, some of it is just nonsense. Mm. Yeah. Um, thanks, I'm just conscious we've only got about another 10 minutes. No, I will have to go at half past. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just on environment, because I, I was, uh, we've got the two Pauls have both got their hands up, but I was on the, uh, when I worked in the Council on the Environment um, Committee, um, so making the, on the legislation going through it, um, and what really scares me now about not just environment, but food standards, um, animal welfare, all of these things, yep. um, is the, what I kind of now see as an erosion of democracy coming out of Westminster because of what's happening to the devolution settlement. And with things like the internal market bill and then the bills that have been going through this week about how we can adjust um, EU legislation, all of that power is being taken straight back to Westminster. And if, if the internal market bill is governed by the lowest common denominator in terms of environmental standards for farmers, in terms of welfare, animal welfare standards, then it's going to be extremely hard to enforce those standards in Scotland. Yeah, but, but, it, but it shouldn't be. I mean, it, the, the, the internal market bill, which, you know, had it not been Brexit, we wouldn't have had this in the first place, but we've got it. And the internal market bill should not be driven by ideology. It should be driven by the practice of what is right for Scotland exactly. and, and the UK. And, and I think both governments have got a lot of work to do uh, to ensure that it is, because it, it, internal market bill... Um, is something that, or you know, I, I think it's been wound up in um, party political prejudices um, far too easily. And I, I think uh, you made an interesting point, Joe, just now about uh, how the political system works. It, it should work uh, for the public and the people who are at the front line of delivering exactly what we're talking about, not the politicians. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, politics across uh, Scotland, across the UK has become, uh, it's not just tribal, it's become very uh, bureaucratic and involved in um, systems that tend to dominate all the political debate. And that, that's just not right. And that's uh, a big worry to me that, you know, we, we, we can't seem ever to get free of that. 
Thank you. And I hope you will keep the Scottish Government to task on all of that. I will be. Anyway, I will have to go in about five minutes because yeah, I've, I've got to go. have had their hands up for a wee while. So yep. Paul, Paul um, Northway, I think you were first. It's a very quick one. Um, we've asked this of all the Scottish MSPs so far, is we support the reintroduction of a ferry link to oh, yeah. from Recife to uh, Europe. We've seen the impact of Brexit and the highly successful Irish solution, which is direct ferry. We need to increase our connectivity to Europe. It is very obvious. And it, it seems to be too obvious that reintroduction of the ferry link is part of the answer. What do you think? Well, as somebody whose family came from Fife, uh, somebody who represents Fife, and uh, somebody who was actually already booked to go on the ferry, um, when, just before it was uh, chopped off, um, I would be very much in favour. I mean, I used to, uh, I'm, I'm a great um, uh, sort of Euro European uh, person. I, I spend most of my summer holidays in Switzerland, but over the years I have travelled uh, a lot to uh, Europe, uh, to Belgium, to Holland, um, and I've used the ferries um, rather than anything else. Uh, so I would be uh, very, very much in favour of it being restored. I think we have to do everything possible to increase our links uh, to, to Europe, but also to make sure that the transport system uh, is absolutely integrated. I mean, I would make the point that uh, in Switzerland, uh, it is an absolute delight to go anywhere on public transport in Switzerland because it all works on time. It's all interlinked, uh, whereas in Scotland, that is not always the case. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done on that, but you're, you're quite right in principle. We need to ensure that our links with Europe uh, are as strong as ever, and I, I, I certainly would um, uh, back the uh, ferry between Resyth and uh, uh, going across to um, Rotterdam and Belgium, etc. I think it's, uh, it's absolutely crucial. Sure. Thanks for bringing that up, Paul. And after our meeting with Willie, actually, he, he wrote to the Transport Minister and he wrote to the Port Authority, um, Liz, so it'd be great if you could do the same. I think the more... Yeah, well, I, I think I have actually in the past, but I'll, I'll try again. <laughs> Good, okay. And Paul Visney, you had um, a question. Hello, I'm sorry, I, I tuned in rather late. and If you covered this item earlier, then please forgive me. But when I, I did come in, I heard you say that... Uh, Basically, we are where we are as far as Brexit is concerned, and we have to respect the, the referendum. But one aspect that wasn't in fact on the ballot paper was our membership of the single market. There are, as you know, other countries which are not part of the European Union that do, do participate in the single market. Uh, and I know it's quite late now, um, but... Briefly, what can you say to persuade me that it would not be a good idea? Well, to me, the single market is absolutely crucial. I mean, I, I said um, maybe just before you did come on that I had uh, various reasons for being such an ardent uh, European. One of them was very much about the economies of scale and the, the, the economic benefits that you get from um, being part of Europe. Um, and the single market was absolutely crucial to that. So you know, I, I, I think that it would be beneficial uh, to uh, remain part of that single market because I think it does so much for our exports and imports and the, the, the way that um, Scottish trade, or UK trade has always been over the last uh, 50 years, uh, it has, has been very strong in that single market. And I, I think it benefits um, the expertise that we have for a lot of the industries and services that we're uh, good at. Um, and so, you know, the single market, for, to my mind, it, it is um, uh, crucial. And I think it's been a great loss with the, the Brexit scenario. But, you know, that's a negotiation for the Westminster government, sadly, not for me, not for the Scottish government. Um, but um, yes, you're quite right. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, and it would also resolve the situation as far as Northern Ireland is concerned. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. I mean, this Northern Ireland uh, thing, well, look at, look at what's happened in the last 24 hours. Um, it's quite clear that there are significant problems about this. And I mean, yeah. well, uh, thank I'm, you very much indeed. Thank not you. at all. Not at all. 
And on that point, just before you go on the Northern oh. Ireland thing, um, apparently we still haven't got access to Horizon, which you mentioned earlier. Um, and that that's because everything else is enclosed. The whole Northern Ireland issue is still an issue. And so this means that lots of our fantastic research scientists in, in Scotland and the rest of the UK are not able to be applying for. Yeah, I, 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 you're, you're right. I mean, I think that, that, that there was a huge worry when this first happened because there were there were people, as you know, a research project tends to be done. Um, with uh, international cooperation with the university, and you, know, you have people who uh, are Scottish, um, who may be French, who may be from Malaysia, Singapore, wherever it might be. And a lot of the university research projects, including in St Andrews, um, benefited so much from that uh, integration of lots of different uh, nationalities participating. And, and the big worry about the Horizon uh, issue was that there's the, for, for those projects where there had been a Scottish lead in these international projects, the um, lead was beginning to say, well, hang on a minute, with Brexit, we might not be prepared to be such a, a lead because we might not get the same level of investment in our research project. And that was a, that, that was a massive worry. Uh, and there, there, was, there was good evidence to suggest that Scottish research um, was suffering because not so many people were willing to be the lead in an international project. But it's uh, great for Horizon as well, because we had the we often had the facilities, and that was why exactly we you're exactly right. Having mm -hmm. said that, I think there is some progress in this uh, through the research councils. Um, and Scot Scotland, uh, I remember debating this with uh, Alistair Darling, actually, I was on the same side as Alistair Darling against um, uh, some of those who uh, wanted uh, Brexit way back in uh, 2014 at a debate in Glasgow University. And at that time, the uh, percentage share of uh, university research that came to Scotland um, was 14%, which is well above the sort of average 10% that you get for other things. And that had gone down um, just immediately after Brexit. But I do think some of the research councils, all credit to them, have done a good job to try to re-engage with the international community. And I think there is some sign that we're beginning to pull back a bit. So that's good, but it's not enough. But it's, I, I think we're moving in the right direction on that. Yeah, but pressure on Westminster to get everything else fixed because they will not let us start drawing down from that until the yeah. whole government's agreed. Anyway, I know you have to rush. Yes, um, I do. We'll just have to have you back again some other time. <laughs> that's fine. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you so much to everybody. Thank you for the invitation, but thank you so much to everybody and uh, excellent questions. Really well, good. Thank you. It was really good fun. Yeah. And if we get back to in person, we'll have you along. <laughs> right, good. Uh, yes, I'd like that. And could you say my best wishes to John? I will, of course. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. All right. Bye bye just now. Bye.